Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming all the way up here to the fourth floor of this beautiful building. Um, my name is Meg Butler. Are you going to sit? I'm going to stand. Is that okay? yeah, I was, was going to stay when I talk. Oh, oh, okay. Well, my name is Meg Butler. You, I was going to ask you to introduce yourself. So I'm, like, I'm Edward Hart. And I'm the uh, assistant dean at UNC Dallas. And uh, I had the, the fun of starting the legal research program from scratch, <laughs> both for the 1Ls and for advanced legal research. And uh, I'm very happy that we landed on this book finally. It only took us three years. <laughs> Actually, I'm starting. Yeah, on you're it. starting. I'm so starting that's, yeah. <laughs> um, so this is this is the book that we're here to talk about today. It is an e late Nail publication from Cali, um, and we tell you about how in all their formats. And it's one of many textbooks and other books that they publish that are available. Well. Um, <clears throat> Like I said, it took us three years to get here. Our first year, we actually used legal re research illustrations. Um, the kids loved it. Uh, it's fairly um, concise and to the point, um, but it is costly, 101 bucks. Um, of course, the thing with wanting to do in-class exercises, um, flipping the class, telling the students to do the reading beforehand, and you know, with some lectures and stuff on hand. Well, you need to do some exercises from class. Well, this book does have uh, assignments that are written by uh, Susan Phillips over at Texas A&M, but that's another $39. So you now talk about $140. Um, another great thing about this, it comes in this bound book. And, you know, when we're doing this, you couldn't get it as a PDF. You couldn't get it as a Word document. And it's made to for you to be able to rip out the pages like a workbook and turn it in. It just, yeah, it wasn't very good. Didn't like it at all. Um, so at uh, Georgia State, we have had a number of different iterations of textbooks that we've used. And in the time that I've been there, I've been there almost 10 years now, um, maybe nine years. So at one point when I first arrived we had actually sort of a homegrown who knows who really wrote it uh, set of handouts that we had one handout for each week. Did you use that? Yeah, um, we have a, an audience member who has in fact used that. It was okay but it took a lot of work because we had to do quality control every time we had to update slides that like all the images from showing how to use different research systems that were online. And then we had all the editorial controls, like, you know, it, because chapters, different chapters were written by different members of the library faculty. So, you know, one person might capitalize internet, one person might not, or, you know, and you can just imagine, <coughs> multiply that out. Are we, because this was back, like, well, is it Westlaw? Is it Westlaw next? Is it Westlaw? Like, who knows? All of those things always had to be addressed. And um, we did our best but we weren't happy with that so we did an exhaustive survey we actually solicited from the vendors all that we could find of the legal research textbooks divided them out among us and then reviewed them including in our excel spreadsheet of glory uh, like the prices various features and we concluded that um, in the end most of us settled on the federal legal research book by Mary Garvey Algero, the Carolina Academic Press publication. I, this is the first edition. It's now, there's two more past this, but I took this picture so you could kind of see. I don't know how well you can see. It's pretty dog-eared because I used it for a few years. I was really excited about this book because this book, the sources, is free, which is a lovely thing. Um, and I think it's very accessible. This book is also very accessible. If you if you were going to consider, in my opinion, like teaching back and forth, and I have taught with both, I'm just this semester again, um, because again, you always make your, your textbook decision considering your audience. Um, I t taught the LLM program of our foreign trained lawyers this last semester, and I thought they, they liked this book. Um, whereas last year when I tried with them, the poor trained lawyers using this book, it wasn't as successful. So it's an interesting mix, but um, I've used this book in my legal research class for 1Ls, which is a required one credit class for the last three years as well. So that was us, me talking about writing a text. It was a pain in the neck. Don't do it if you don't have to. 
Um, so this book is written by Bo Stein and Tina Brooks, uh, both at the University of Kentucky. Um, it is available in print uh, for the bargain basement price of $4.22, which is a reduction. Because last year, it was, what, $11 and something? Um, I've heard uh, Mr. Meyer, who's, who is present, that uh, he cracks up the Lulu people with the fact that he doesn't want to make money off this book. He just wants to sell it for as portable as they can. Yeah, Lulu, Lulu loves not working with nonprofits. They'll sell your books for you. If you don't mark them up, they don't make, then, then they won't take their cut either. So, oh, that's nice. So, so, so if you're not getting a cut, then they're not getting a cut either. So the 422 is like their just their cost of, of doing the work. Yeah, that's it's great. Um, but what's really great about this book is it's available in different formats. You can get it in whatever ebook you want to for your iPad, Nuke. Um, get it for your Kindle. You can get it as a Word file. This is the students. The students can download this directly from the Cali website. Um, you can also get it as a PDF version. Now remember that, the Word and the PDF versions, because the, particularly the Word version is that this is published under a Creative Commons licensing, and it has the attribution, non-commercial, share-alike, share-alike um, concerns. So the share is that you will copy and redistribute Mr. Hills in any, you can, copy and redistribute these materials in any form or format that you want to. Uh, you can adapt, which means you can remix, transform, build upon the materials. Um, and the licensor cannot revoke these freedoms as long as you follow these license terms. So basically, you can slice and dice this book in any way you want to. And because it's published for you in a Word file, it's so bloody easy. Can I, can I just that. ask, how many, of you, how many of you have looked at this book already? Has anybody here actually taught with it yet? Okay, thanks, Katie. Nice so um, that's interesting. H have you, con the rest of you, have you considered teaching with it, or are you still just thinking about how to adapt it? You can't hurt my feelings. I'm, don't, don't <laughs> yeah. feel free to say whatever you want. I'm in the process of looking to adapt and play around with it and teach various classes. For it. Yes. It occurs to me that maybe that might help us focus. If you've all already looked at it. <laughs> then you know, and maybe you want to hear more of us talking about our problems. Yeah. Uh, of course, the other great thing about it being in the format it's at is that the book just came out in 2015, and it's already on to its third edition. So the authors can update it uh, fairly quickly <coughs> over the summer, I guess, and uh, put out a new edition for us with any corrections and updates. It's not like the old traditional press, which takes months and months. So you actually go years in between editions, you know, correcting errors or anything. Um, it does come with the fact that you, you can, um, listed in the book for each chapter, are the Cali lessons that um, can go on. Um, and we adapt those to ourselves because we can't, you know, it will list every appropriate Cali lesson for that chapter. Yes, sir. I have a question back on the last slide yeah. uh, regarding the der derivative works. Is there an easy way or is there kind of method set up for making those derivative works available in the same printing or cheap printing format? In other words, if a professor decides they want to use this book but make some changes, are both those books available somewhere or how is that working? So, so the, the so, so mostly yes. There's another website called lawbooks.cali.org, which is a um, uh, which is run press books. I don't know if you've ever heard of press books. Anybody's ever heard of press books? It's an open source um, Creative Commons publishing platform created by uh, what's the guy's name? He was a he was our keynote speaker uh, last year, maybe the year before. Hugh, um, I'm forgetting his name. Anyhow. You can you can go there and make a copy of the book into press books and then make changes on the website and then press a button and get it back out as a PDF and, uh, and some other formats. Um, but not to the Kindle production stage yet or Kindle's harder for automaticity and, and so and so is Word. And I, and I won't I won't lie to you and say 
that whenever you, whenever you crack open something as big as a book with all its uh, footnotes and all its yeah. interrelationships, it's, it's not like, oh, just touch it and, uh, and I'm done. You right. know what I mean? You, you have to sort of be serious and get, and get into it because you're republishing right. a book. Um, but, it, but it's absolutely possible and it's, and it's been getting easier and easier and easier with every iteration of press books. Now, we do use a, um, an online course management system, Canvas, and we're trying to work our way towards that, you know, because we can cut this up to each chapter and make it, and create a module for each of its topics. And the advantage of having the Cali lessons is you have the lessons links. So you can go into Cali as the professor of the class, capture a special link for the, your Cali lesson that you're having the students do, share that link with the students, and it will track them. So you can see that the students are doing it. Now we don't, the student, our, in our class, the student's grade does not pin in on the actual results from the Kaya lesson. We're just looking at they took the lesson. Um, now I'll talk later about the Kaya lessons because there's some ups or downs with that according to the students. Um, we've also, <coughs> building up our content, has been adding in our own in-house, uh, going towards the steps about flipping so that when we're in the actual class as much as we can about doing exercises, exercises, exercises and hands-on materials. Did you want to say about Quimby? You were going to talk about Quimby. I was going to talk about Quimby. You're the one using Quimby. Uh, I can't remember what I was going to say about Quimby, so we'll move on. <laughs> well, I have a question about Quimby. Do, you, um, do students use the case outlines or the case briefs or do they use the videos? We we don't subscribe to the outlines portion of that product. We do the, the lessons, and I've known in our advanced legal research class, we have pushed more of the Quigley lessons as a step up. Um, this is this is at the top at the top of our list of how to better incorporate the Quigley into the Canvas modules, pairing it with the appropriate chapters from this textbook. So. I'm reflecting when I talk about Panopto and Play Plaza a little bit um, on my experience, but also I'm reflecting on the experience of Patrick Parsons, who is not able to be here today. Um, somebody has to be at the reference desk. Thanks, Patrick, um, who has done much more using Play Plaza. Um, but in terms of in-house videos, he has made a number of videos, and I, I have as well, um, that are incorporated into the content management system or the learning management system for the course. Um, we use desire to learn which has Panopto inside it and that's a screen capturing thing that you can talk, you know, voice over, pick up what you're saying while you're screen capturing. And then you can take that same video that maybe has questions and answers embedded in it and um, send it to PlayPosit, which will then caption the video and then um, you can have a video that has like a pause and then like the students have to answer like a multiple choice question or something like that and then they can get automatic feedback sort of in the same way that students get automatic feedback in um, or immediate feedback in the Cali lessons um, but only in the context of watching a video. The cautionary note that I have for you is that when you try using PlayPosit you should definitely test it out. Um, it has improved. I was an early adopter. That's the problem with me in early adoption. Every time I try something early adoption there's a problem and it just makes me not want to use it anymore. Um, and so I made like three videos and sent them off and they were fine. They were at the right resolution and when they came back from PlayPosit they had done, they'd monkeyed with it and the students, like you couldn't actually read the, the language on the video screens that they were supposed to be following along and clicking along with, which kind of took the value of that away. Um, but that's actually been a really helpful tool to accompany the sources book because the sources book can, conveys a bunch of information, but the PlayPosit videos do a nice job of showing how that how those legal research resources may manifest in Lexis or Westlaw, in case you were thinking as a student, well, it's great that there are three branches of government, but now how do I find statutes? <laughs> like, take me through the trail on Lexis. Like, how do I find the statutes for my jurisdiction? Um, now, we use the, the in-house videos, and we use Snagit. There, and the main purpose we're doing that is providing the state content, 
because we do cover that in our 1L class. And this is uh, why well, primarily focus on the federal law. It does use some examples from other states, but it doesn't actually cover the content to provide that bibliographic introduction. So that's where we use that to fill in the gaps. Um, you know, we've had this conversation about pushing the Creative Commons envelope even farther if we ever had the time and that to write our own uh, sections for Texas to go and insert in this and to uh, republish it with that in there, the state content. Um, now this is taking a huge step back that I should have talked about before in that um, at UNT, UNT Dallas we um, do get to teach a two credit 1L research class that's standalone in the spring semester. Um, we're doing this both for day and evening students. And we have the class have been structured so far as two separate one-hour classes. We are trying to do away with doing lectures in the first class that it is more a demonstration of whatever the platform or whatever the source we're looking at. Um, that you know whatever the bibliographic information that we've read about it was also been uncovered whatever is necessary in uh, the Snagit lectures or the uh, recorded lectures before class. And that for the second hour of the week when they come in, uh, into breakout sessions, it all is all about hands-on exercises. All right. um, like I said, we do supplement the book with hands-on materials. And like I said, the big gap is the fact it doesn't have the, very much in the way of the state specific materials. It has state examples, but in actual in depth materials. Um, so we have seen about capturing in other stuff. Um, each chapter in the book ends with three sets of exercises. And we use the introduction in the intermediate exercises from the book as the starting points for our exercises in the class. Um, the advanced <coughs> assignment from the class and, the, and in the back of the chapter is what we use as a starting point for the homework. Um, it is kind of interesting that it takes them only a couple weeks to start figuring out our pattern and they start ask, asking questions about the advanced <laughs> question when we're going over the class exercise. So they, 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 they catch on real quick. Um, the one other thing we've done is that Bless Bo and Tina Soul. I mean, a lot of their state examples they do give are Kentucky. So we do end up having to uh, take the assignments and rewrite them for Texas. Um, so we actually pull out the assignments from the uh, from the Word document file, and then where possible, we substitute Texas. And of course, then we have to go double check what the answer is, so that we know what to help the students to go find for. Um, of course, we don't use the whole book. There are some things in there that are uh, we can't cover in a content for two weeks. So here's some examples of some what we've redone, adding in the paths for the changes. Right. Um, like I said before, we do do the CAD lessons. Um, we limit ourselves because we don't want to kill the students because they list every Cali lesson that's appropriate for that chapter. So we try to narrow it down to just two. Um, there are some problems with some of the Cali lessons. Some of the Cali lessons are quite dated. Some of the Cali lessons, well, they're very dated because some of them are still for Westlaw, not for Westlaw Next, not for Westlaw we have now. But we do narrow it down to make sure we have two uh, lessons for each of the chapters. Uh, of course, we also did the two Texas ones that are provided in Cali. that are the state specific for uh, primary sources and secondary sources. Right. <clears throat> so at GSU for the College of Law, we have, like Ed does, both day and evening students. We have a part-time program which most of the students are in the evening section, but every once in a while we have a part-timer in the day. Um, we also have the foreign trained lawyers studying in the LLM program. The 1Ls are taught by the teaching librarians in the fall in a 10-week 
sort of intensive class that's one credit pass fail. The LLMs have a two credit graded course in the spring. And um, so for the one Ls, we have our, I mean, as you can see, we have our 90 minute meeting and I'm talking mostly for the rest of this about the one Ls experience because um, I think this is better suited for the one Ls than I think the LLMs. Um, can you just say why that is because I teach? Sure. I think, and, and I, I'm actually, I'm not certain if I'm overgeneralizing based on having taught with both the Algero book and the Sources book for two different, two different cohorts of students. And I don't know if it's a function of the difference between the cohorts because the cohort group that I had this year was really great and the cohort group that I had last year was less great. And I don't know if that's a function of the book that I chose or if that's just sort of independent. Um, but I think there's an element of the purchase that maybe is a little bit bigger with the foreign students um, that they had to go spend $32. And I think also that um, not many of my students have made the, have gone to the trouble of printing this out. I, in fact, have never seen, this is the, today is the first time I've ever actually seen like not at a conference, like not at a Cali booth. <laughs> I've actually seen anybody who actually printed it. Um, my students have always used, and like I've, in the library, I've only seen, and we've all used it, okay. the downloaded PDF or Word document. And I think that the foreign students do better, sort of the cognition stuff is better if you have something in print. And um, so it's helpful to them to have a book that's already been bound. And I think there's also some of the charts and graphs in Algero that I that I use um, and I use sometimes I use them with the one else that talk about the research process and like the sort of flow charts that um, this book doesn't have as much of that okay. sort of thing which I think can be helpful if you're trying to take an existing schema of how you do something because in theory all of our foreign trained lawyers have an existing schema they know how to conduct research at least in their own home country or their home jurisdiction and they're trying to adapt or relate the American way to what they already know. And those charts can help sort of make those connections happen better. Um, excellent question. Thank you, Kathy. So in my 1L classes, I've moved more toward a flipped model. And um, I have divided my class up into groups. And each group of students is responsible for teaching, assisting um, every week in the semester with the problems, the in-class problems that we all do together during our class time. And um, I, in the past, have done more lecture type classes and had different assignments, one assignment every week. At this point now, we have weekly assignments that are done in class and then two or three sort of bigger projects that take them through primary sources, like secondary sources, primary sources, and then putting the two together. Um, and that's the framework for how I like the context for what I'm doing when I'm using the sources book. Um, I usually select, you know, my readings and um, sometimes I will supplement with the process of legal research because I think that there are some things in that that talk about um, in the Kuntz book. You, are you guys familiar with that one? Um, there's some elements of the Kuntz book that I really like um, that talk about more about the theory behind how something is retrieved from a database search system than the sources book does. And then the Algero book, like I mentioned, it talks some about the process of like start here, go there, why we do that. I, unlike Ed, assign Cali exercises, but I don't, I just tell my students they're required. I do not um, take advantage of the great opportunity of being able to look and see whether they've completed them because I find it more satisfying to not know whether they have completed them. <laughs> like, I can approach the class with a better attitude and I like to think that my students are adults and at this point like they need to figure out what works for them and I've had some <coughs> students who tell me that they're fantastic and they're really helpful and I, I you know I tell them all at the beginning the lessons are fantastic they're really helpful I got an A plus in evidence because I did all the evidence Kelly lessons it's a great thing you should take advantage of it and if they choose not to 
I figure that's on them. Like they're going to be the ones making choices in life. And, um, and so then I let them, because I think enough people do them and find them helpful that people talk about it amongst themselves. I, I do specifically have one week of class where there's no reading from sources and what's assigned are the Georgia specific primary and secondary sources lessons. And then I have in the past, less this last year, but I have in the past relied upon the vendor videos or training for how to use their research systems. Um, I dropped it last year because, do you guys remember the, um, like you've, you've obviously, probably, I'm assuming you're all familiar with the LexisLearn video content. And then Westlaw had its thing that I don't remember the name of. Again, early adopter, it didn't work very well and I had a lot of students who were freaking out because they couldn't do the videos and they were so afraid that it was going to hurt their grades and I was like, you know what, I'm just going to cut that as a requirement because I don't want people to be freaking out. Like, just because the video doesn't work on some vendor's site, you're, I don't want you to freak out. Like, you're one else in the fall. Like, your stress levels are really high. <laughs> Let's dial it back a little. Um, so those are the different kinds of things I have chosen to supplement. So I, I tend to do less like cutting and pasting of sources and more thinking about like what I want to add in as extra, which maybe makes my students do too much work. Don't tell them I said that. Can you cut that part out, Adam? Sorry, what? Can you cut out that part, you know? Uh, sure. Sure. Excellent. There we go. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. So for assessment, I've used Socrative for in-class work. My students like it and don't like it. Um, I stopped using slides. Um, have you guys used, used Socrative before? Um, Socrative, I talked to our instructional designer. I said, what I want is an Excel spreadsheet, something that looks like its output is like an Excel spreadsheet where I can just look and scan down all the answers and see who got it right, question by question by question. And that's what Socrative does. Like you enter your students' names, which you can do in an Excel file, and then you can um, input questions and answers. You can go teacher's paste, you can do independently paste. And um, I use that for in-class work because then I can sort of monitor on my one screen how well everybody's doing. Is there somebody who's lagging behind who's only answered two out of 15 questions and we're 45 minutes into class? Um, and I can also see, um, you know, are the answers mostly right or it, it really quickly instead of having, it, it just makes it easier to see where the problem spots are in class. Um, and then you can also include answer information so that people can sort of, again, have that self-correcting benefit. My students don't love Socrative because I stopped doing slides and I don't, and so they don't have slides afterwards. Sometimes the Socrative questions can serve as a teaching function and they're like, but I want to look again. I'm like, well, once I take away the quiz for the week, it's gone. Sorry. And I don't really, I'm kind of hard-hearted Hannah about that. Um, I also have the students post summaries of the, the week's reading. So I've accepted that probably every week only the research leaders are doing the reading for the week <laughs> and they're providing their, their classmates a summary of what they have read and that everybody's got that sort of executive summary to go through. So um, yeah, that's just how life is. Um, then we have our big assignments. And the big assignments are... Um, longer, more free-flowing fact pattern, and then they have to figure stuff out from there. They don't always have a good answer. They don't always have an, an, an answer. Um, and then I love to do animal problems and things that I can get from the headlines. So I've used problems in the past about like whether Justin Bieber should be booted out of the country because of his egging of his neighbors. Did that vandalism constitute an aggravated crime, like a crime of moral turp turpitude that such that he should be ejected from the country because he's Canadian? Really? No laughter? No, no. Tim Kardashian and like whether or not, no? 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 Okay. Yeah, so I go for like the headlines that are sort of sensational, which the foreign students are completely befuddled by. Um, but hey, you know, like sometimes they pay attention, sometimes they know. Um, they really had a problem this last year with Kylie versus Kylie. They didn't remember <laughs> Kylie Minogue and Kylie Jenner. That was a mystery. But I also go with the animal stories because there's like, you know, we've all heard of the dog bite, but what about the goat that was roaming the cul-de-sac? Or, um, you know, 
whatever. There's lots of good animal problems out there. Um, I think that those, I try in my assessments, I, like I don't rely on the sources assessments so much. I make up my own and there's always that range, like are you doing a treasure hunt or are you giving something where there's not a known answer? And I've settled for now, it's always an evolution, but where I've settled for now is that I, I like to give in class things that are more treasure hunt, out of class things that, because I want them to practice learning how to do, do the elements of that kind of problem. Like you only have, say, they say, about six pieces worth of working memory available to you at any time. And you're using that working memory when you're using a new book, like trying to remember how am I supposed to use this book? What is this thing called? Is this federal or is this state? I mean, like all of those are different pieces of working memory that you're using up. And what, but once you have it down, how to use the book, all of those pieces move out of your working memory and into your stored memory. And then you can actually keep elements of the problem in your working memory. And that is the premise, like you're, that's why I scaffold from the, the treasure hunt to the harder problems. Um, and grading is a pain, but you all know that. But isn't it wonderful when they do well? The, um, I was going to say, I gave a similar presentation like this at the SWAL meeting, and there's a librarian from St. Mary's who does use sources of American law as well. He does not use the assessments in the book um, for grading purposes, but he tells the students, go through it, review it, and he does take a few minutes of class to check their answers, and he distributes the answer sheets. Because um, one thing I miss, we didn't mention is that there is a teacher's manual that has all the answers in it and some other additional information that are available to you when you log into the Cali site as a faculty member. Yeah. Um, and just to let you know, you know, we're not alone in um, thinking that this is a good book. This is a review from Nick Carroll at the University of Colorado that was a uh, published in our RIPS SIS Legal Research Tax Review. Um, that sums it pretty good. So the student feedback that I've had at UNT Dallas, you know, the price is right. Um, the multiple formats. This year, this, this, so this is the second year we used this. This year, some of the students got very creative. I actually had one student who had, she had it littered up in her laptop. She always had it open in class, and when we went through uh, the exercise and everything, she kept and would insert her notes into that Word document. I had one other student uh, who I met was an older student. He actually printed out the whole book, had a three-ring binder, and he would insert his note pages, the notes he took himself, and insert the homework in there. He would insert a printout of the uh, some of the Cali lessons in there, and he developed his own notebook for the whole semester, all there together, integrating the text. Um, the cow lessons, yeah, that is probably the weak point, uh, and we still can't get around. There are some, like say, cow lessons that are really outdated, uh, so you need to make sure carefully you go through themselves to make sure they're appropriate for what you're trying to get to in the class. Um, I made a mistake last year and um, trying to introduce them to the digest. I forgot to go check the digest cow lesson and afterwards I found out that, oh, it's based on the digest in print. It's not the online anymore. If anyone would um, like to uh, help us uh, update those lessons, uh, contact Deathly Cow. We will pay you. Um, and of course we had, uh, when we've used the vendor, which I think you were just talking about, the use the vendor's videos, they're not they're too much of a salesmanship for their product, not necessarily trying to get a, a neutral lesson across it. You're trying to get across, especially in a one credit class. Um, but what they did like about the lessons um, that were in here and the exercise in here is that they're, uh, it's not like such a fishing esoteric exercise that it is in some of the textbooks. Um, you know, with this switch towards practice ready attorneys, something more, I don't want to say simpler, more direct, that this is being written and the plan that's being written is uh, heading a better uh, nerve with the students. And I think that's it. Is there any questions from anybody?
this is a little out of scope, so feel free to say this is out of scope. Um, so given your experience, have you or have you thought about kind of using this to promote the adoption of like open textbooks like with among fa other faculty at your law school? Uh, I have. Um, I know last year our two civil procedure professors were looking for, well, two, two years ago, our civil procedure professors were looking for a new textbook. And I told them about the success we had had that year with this, and I showed them the one that uh, Cali does use. Um, unfortunately, one of those professors got a book offer, so he wrote the textbook. <laughs> <laughs> um, but at the same time, we've talked about this and introduced about the Creative Commons licensing. I've had two of my professors go out on their own platform, on their own, and pull together all the materials they want to use, all the statutes, all the cases, and they've written that, you know, the commentary themselves. And I keep telling them, hey, Callie will buy that off of you and give you, you know, there's a, a thing you can tick off on your tenure process. It's very strange. I mean, yeah, people will write their own books. And we will pay them a serious amount of money. It's not, it's not jump change. Um, but, they, but, then they, but, but when we buy a book, we got to own the copyright so that we can put the Creative Commons license on that gives yeah. people down the, down the path. And so faculty don't want to give up their copyright, even though they could like grab the, the Creative Commons version and do whatever they want. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's fine. And it's... Um, and like I said, the, the, the two professors I have, they're not making money off of it. They're, they're basically selling it to the students what it costs them to print it and bind it. Yep. Yeah. So, um, and like I say, and, they, and then I hear from those students, this year I heard from those students, they said, gee, I wish Professor So-and-so would make a Word document PDF file with it <coughs> just like this was available. See, and that, that, is, that is exactly why we did this. Obviously, we're not doing it to make money. We're giving them away. Our goal is to put pressure on the entire system to open up educational resources because then you can get those creative students and creative faculty doing stuff with the material that you just can't do under a commercial model yeah. that is required to, to DRM it to, keep, to make sure that money and royalties are paid. Yeah. I mean, the professor's loving the fact that he's, because uh, I've heard he was doing it again this summer, he's, he is tweaking his content and he's printing just enough, you know, for what he needs for that class, next class. So he's buying into that the advantage of this kind of things. I just wish I could give the share the content. So at, at Georgia State, just to share our experience, um, we actually have uh, two members of the faculty who are uh, very active in Cali. Um, is Patrick still on the board? Still is, until yeah. he retires. Yeah, so uh, Patrick Wiseman is on the board, and he's also a faculty member, and Chris Niedringhouse is the vice president, I believe, yeah. and she's also a faculty member. Um, so we have a great awareness, I think, among our faculty and, an, and a willingness to move outside of the regular textbook. We have another faculty member who made her own corporation's book, not with Cali, but using another online platform. Um, and so I think it, that it's coming. It's becoming increasingly um, more visible to faculty members, thanks in part to things like the Elaine Dell platform, that um, you don't have to buy into the traditional model of textbook stuff. And um, and I think actually that some of the maneuvers of the big companies are helping that process along where they're making it harder to get review copies and they're making it hard. Like, I think those things help make it less useful. Well, I've talked to a... Okay, I can't touch it. Um, <laughs> So I know of at least a half a dozen authors who have gone to the commercial publishers and said, I want to do what I want to do with you because they want the prestige of publishing with the commercial publisher, but I want the licensing that Cali can do because of the capabilities that it gives the adoptees and things like that. And they're struggling with how to balance those sort of two things. And I just laugh in my back. <laughs> well, uh, that was our plan. Plan well done. Um, so speaking of things you can't really do on a commercial environment, um, and out of date Cali lessons, um, there is actually a way, and I do this, uh, if you're ambitious and are willing to email back and forth with Dip, which I'm about 100 times a day, um, you can actually download the Cali lessons 
and open them up in um, Cali Author, adapt them, and mm -hmm. then upload them to auto publish so that you're, you know. Oh, cool. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, it makes total sense that you'd be able to do that. Right. So but I good for you for having the initiative. Yeah, well, it's, I mean, it is, it's, it, yeah. there's a learning curve involved, but once you can do it, um, so for example, there's a great secondary source lesson. I don't remember who wrote it, but it was all print books. Yeah. So I just grabbed that, adapted it, made mm -hmm. it online, and published it for my students. So, but I just want to point out that yeah. that's possible. Thank you. You know, because Cal makes that stuff. Yep, yep, yay. Exactly. And we're working on a new version of Kelly Author. That, that, will be, that will be web based so that Mac users can find the author. It's the current version of Kelly Author, which is about 14 years old. Oh, wow. You know, it's, a, it's a Windows program. Um, and the goal is to uh, basically make that whole production process an entirely web based one. It's like faculty member comes in, sees Kelly Lesson, likes it, clones it. Messes with it, it's published. Students get a URL. You know, and they have these, like, really happy any way they want it, any way they want to do it. That's great. So you know, we're, we're in, 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 and I can't I can't take credit for all these ideas. I mean, I'm inspired by what uh, Harvard tried to do with H two O, um, but they're struggling struggling with that just because this, you know there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, a lot of content moving parts here to make this work. But yeah. but we think we could. You know, the tools are there now. We can make yeah. pull this Are there other questions? And just to say, if you had logged in to the Cali website, it knows that you're a faculty member on the same page that you would find the book and everything. One of the options they hear towards the bottom would be that teacher's manual. Yeah. Well, I strongly encourage you all to think about if you, I know, you all said you were already thinking about it. Um, I've had good experiences using this book, and I hope that you all are able next year to report back that you've had some good experiences. Yes, ma'am? I also had very positive experience using it, and the lessons are very, very useful. I, in fact, to make my students do the intro lesson before class, which sometimes they get really annoyed about because it takes, you know, three times the time, but they spend all of that time working with the system, which they wouldn't necessarily if I just showed them how to do it. So I was really happy with the book. Thanks, Katie. Yes, ma'am. Oh. The, no, the, the puzzle I still have is the fact is we're still having to come up with content for our advanced legal research class because I do believe this. I mean, the authors talk about it. this is built for 1Ls. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so by the time your 1L has gone through this, um, I mean, maybe those who have the problem of the legal writing people teaching research or not teaching research, you still might want to consider this for your advanced research. But, you know, for us, um, there, that still is a gap that we need to fill. Some of my ignorance will show us, but I'll ask a student first. Advanced legal research courses more subject specific, so it's advanced in. Not necessarily. Or intellectual property or something. It depends. Some, right? It depends. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, some some classes may have a basic review slash overview. They may go and then have subject specific weeks, if you assuming a semester long model, as opposed to weekend model or something else. Um, some classes may also spend more of their time just focusing on going in greater depth on all of the same things that you hit in a regular maybe 1L class. So for example, most people I understand probably don't teach legislative history in great depth in a 1L class. Um, but that might be something that you spend more time doing in uh, an advanced course. And um, administrative yeah, administrative. Well, see, and that's where like my own preferences are different than like maybe what some other people. I only, I learned legislative history in my 1L class, and I've always taught, I mean, maybe not as well as I could, but because it's, you know, you're jamming in so much content, but um, so it's, it's sometimes it's a, a question of depth of treatment, and I think there's a lot of variety in how people teach it. The things that tend to be more subject specific are um, foreign international legal research, for one, um, and tax research sometimes will get its own special pullout 
Um, are there other classes that you guys can think of that have special? I teach a one credit civil litigation research class, so I do like drafting documents and kind of find stuff. Yeah. I'm doing a drafting documents in what, what type of documents? Uh, well, we start with uh, complaints and go to discovery motions. Oh, litigation. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. I'm starting a transactional research class. For yeah. I think I just based on my pre-advanced legal research assessments, because I've taught a ALR for, I think, five or six years, um, what I find is that people don't seem to know any more before they start ALR than they knew before they start their 1L class, because <laughs> they've had two years to forget everything. You know, most of the time my ALR students were spring semester 3Ls, and so there's a lot of review. So, this, this is like an out of left field sort of question, but, but, uh, but I have a perfect audience to ask it. How valuable? Is, would, would be sort of unfettered access to materials that you could find in PACER to, in building legal research teaching materials? That would be good. I know, um, so Bloomberg is obviously a subscription site, but they link their dockets to my PACER, and I use it all the time, and they show students how to use it. So if we didn't have to pay for it. <laughs> I'm not talking about unfettered access to PACER, but, yeah. but, but unfettered access to maybe the material you can get out of PACER. Yeah, yes. It's a slightly different. Yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 Bloomberg's isn't even, yeah, you search that they have a, because PACER is a search algorithm that's terrible. Or, yeah. or, or, or. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, 10 cents a page. Yeah. <laughs> In addition. Well, the, the question, before I would send Callie down that road, I would really want to, investigate how much duplication there was between what you would think of offering as compared with what Bloomberg already offers. And I would also consider how many people already are boxed into their Bloomberg subscription because BNA materials maybe are something that you can't get without your Bloomberg subscription as they're moving away from having BNA as a separate, um, separately available database set. They want you to get to your BNA only through your Bloomberg Law subscription. And because um, if something's already being done and somebody else is already getting paid for it, and we can't get out of having to pay for that, do you see where I'm going? I sure do. Yeah. Did you still have a question? Oh, uh, it was like a question slash comment, and that is, is anyone working out an advanced legal research book, and they, so they should send it to John so you can publish it. <laughs> or maybe you should. <laughs> uh, that is <laughs> the. I mean, one thing that probably what really first sold me on this book is because I don't remember doing this when I went through law school and when I talked to, when I've taught at the University of Florida, advanced legal research, it never came up about the, the combination of the hierarchy of sources and the jurisdiction. And that is covered in the first chapter here. By, uh, at my law school, we get to do research assignments in eight of the doctrinal classes that we get to grade, and that's part of the student's final grade in that class. And we keep doing one, well, it's the same question that ends up being a constitutional question about a Texas criminal law procedure. You know, usually about, you know, searching without a warrant. And the fact is that, you know, when you've got a state question that becomes a constitutional question, the hierarchy of courts, there's through the state, state highest court, U.S. Supreme Court. The federal district courts, the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals have no binding authority on that question. And you know, the first time, two times I did that Texas criminal procedure question, you know, I was like hitting my head against the wall because the students can't bring it in the fifth U.S. Circuit and that kind of stuff. Well, this book has an exercise at the very beginning that breaks all those out about what happens when you have a state question of law. You know, what's the hierarchy? Of course, it, the other twist to that is if it is a truly state question of law, the kids, the students find that it's, wait a minute, the U.S. Supreme Court is not binding? It's not. And it's a state law question, not a federal question, not a constitutional question. So they do have this exercise in this book, but I've never seen or heard before. And it's a, it was a nice, quick introduction 
to the matter. Any other comments? Considerations? Yes. Uh, it, I think you, it's geared for the introduction class. Is there any sort of legal background that they need to have before they crack open that book, or can you start with it from day one? I don't know, I think you can pretty much... I start with it on day one. I, I sometimes do provide, sometimes. For the one else, I feel like I, there's just, you have to talk about civics at a basic level. I haven't figured out, I mean, maybe I'm feeling a little inspired after the synchronous and asynchronous learning um, session that was earlier today um, to maybe do a little bit more of that in advance of class so that people have a chance to watch the videos and then can come to class without me having to talk about civics that they should know by the time they get to law school. Um, but that's the only I mean, I touch thing. on it when we go into this hierarchy exercise, reminding them that, you know, who is publishing what. Because yeah. I, was, I was, you know, the first five minutes of class in an advanced legal research class, I do the three branches of government just <laughs> to check in. And yeah. yeah. I understand that you all know this book. Yeah. So half the people don't know it. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.